in a world full of celebrity apologists, we are a small time noise. But we make a big time noise for the kingdom of God. You're listening to The Mentionables. And now, here's the team. Today's Mentionable Podcast is a supplementary episode. I'm Joel Furches, and I'm one of the founding members of The Mentionables. In 2014, I had the opportunity and the privilege to publish my book, Christ-Centered Apologetics. On this podcast, I will be reading to you the introduction and first chapter of the book. I had been writing in apologetics for several years when my writings were popular and well-known enough that I was approached by a publication called Bible Translation Magazine to write for them. I wrote for Bible Translation Magazine for probably about a year or two, and that publication turned into a publisher of Christian books, Christian Publishing House, which is still around today. I had been writing in apologetics, and I was approached by my church to do a class in apologetics. Being a writer, the way in which I conducted the class was to write my material that I was teaching in the class. And as a writer, I wrote it in book format, because that's the format that I'm used to. Every class was a chapter of the book. And by the time I was finished teaching the class, I had an entire book on my hands. Now, having connections to Christian Publishing House, I mentioned the project to them, and they assured me that when I was finished, they would publish it. So after about a year of working on this and having a full book, I submitted it to Christian Publishing House, knowing that from their promise they'd publish it. Unfortunately, it was shortly after I submitted it that I got into a disagreement with the editor of Christian Publishing House. It was something minor. It had to do with, say, the title of the book or the formatting of the book or so forth. But the upshot was that they neglected to publish the book as they told me to. So I had a manuscript on my hands and no publisher. I did what any author would have done. I started submitting it around to other publishers. As coincidence would have it, and I say coincidence in quotation marks, the very first publisher I submitted it to, Crosslink Publishers, accepted the manuscript, and by November of 2014, I had a book on the market, my very first book. Today I will be reading you the introduction and first chapter of this book. The title of the book, Christ-Centered Apologetics, is the entire premise of the book, which states that apologetics should be focused on the case for Christ. This is because apologetics and evangelism are two sides of the same coin. If you've made the ontological argument for God's existence, at the very end, you might have convinced somebody that God exists. Probably not, but you might. But you won't have preached the gospel you'll have taken no big steps towards convincing them that they ought to become a Christian. On the other hand, if you defend the case for Christ, and you do it centered around the resurrection with the idea of the gospel in mind, you have not only defended your faith, you've preached the gospel in the process. Therefore, whether preaching the gospels or defending your Christian beliefs, the case for Christ is the central argument on which they should revolve, or at least that's the claim of my book. So enjoy the introduction and first chapter of the book, and we'll see you in the podcast later on. Thank you. In September of 2001, a group of terrorists claiming connections to Islam hijacked and crashed several planes into key locations within the U.S. This act had many repercussions, one of these being a kind of reactionary atheism that has built to academic levels. These so-called new atheists differ from classic atheism in that they are aggressively evangelical, and they believe that society can have morality without religion. Their argument is that religion promotes blind, irrational belief, and that such belief has led to the majority of atrocities throughout the history, as reflected in slogans such as, Science flies us to the moon, Religion flies us into buildings. 
a direct reference to the events of 9-11. This particular ideology has taken over the secular world by storm, essentially bullying anyone who dares to express religious beliefs out of the academic world and making it extremely uncomfortable for non-academics besides. While this may be seen to be a very bad thing for Christianity, it is arguably the best thing to happen to the Christian church in the last century. The church has been, and still is, in a state of lethargy and stagnation. The concepts that pass as theology and doctrine are deplorable, and the majority of people claiming to be Christian have no clear idea what that even means. With the rise of aggressive anti-theism has come a reactionary boom in apologetics, the defense of Christian beliefs. The new atheists are often more informed on the Bible, Christian doctrine, and history than most Christians, and present a challenge for Christians to step up their game and become schooled in their own faith. Since the academic and science worlds are dominated by people who are outspoken opponents of religious beliefs, confrontations with these people can be intimidating indeed. However, it's important to remember that while there is nothing fundamentally incompatible between Christianity and science, philosophy, there are a number of things about reality that Christianity explains, but atheism does not. 1. Why there is something rather than nothing. Try as they might, atheists cannot explain how the universe came to be in the first place. There are no sufficient explanations for how something came from nothing, without a timeless, spaceless first cause. Number two, how life came from non-life. Even if one accepts that over long periods of time, simpler life forms can adapt and change into more complex life forms, atheists still have no sufficient explanation for how life could have arisen from more basic matter. There is no precedent for this and the theories that claim to explain it are vague, to say the least. Life forms appear to be more than simply mechanical systems operating on physics, like the solar system. They appear to have a consciousness and a will, things that are difficult to explain through material means. Number three, immaterial constructs. Even if one gives up the concept of God, there are quite a few recognized immaterial things that one has to struggle with. Things such as thought, truth, logic, morality, purpose, and justice become a real problem if the universe is simply material. One could say that these things are imaginary, but then they would have to explain the immaterial construct of imagination. No matter what atheists throw out against theism, their system falls short of explaining these things. On the other hand, while these things are powerful arguments against atheism, by themselves they do not argue for Christianity. They simply argue for some kind of nebulous, poorly defined deity. So what arguments should Christian apologists focus on? The problem about engaging with any other worldview is that they typically want to object to every single thing that the Christian believes, from the origin of the universe, to the origin of life, to the historicity and reliability of the Bible, to miracles, to morality, to modern politics, and finally, to Jesus himself. There are two dangers of engaging on every single one of these topics. First, the argument never advances. It simply goes down a variety of rabbit trails, but never arrives at any conclusions and the opponent will simply keep digging up more arguments for the Christian to shoot down. Secondly, and worse, if Christians have to be right on every single one of these points in order to hold their faith, they may well find that they are wrong on one or more of their own preconceptions. If this is all it takes to lose their faith, Christians may find themselves doubting because of something that does not directly relate to the fundamentals of being a Christian. For this reason, it is important to identify the non-negotiables. That is, those things that, if proven false, would actually defeat Christianity. Once the Christian identifies these non-negotiables, they may countenance all manner of arguments on the part of the atheist, even if they have no good answers saying, even if your argument is true, this remains the case. From 
Apostle Paul onward, Christian evangelism has always focused on two things, law and gospel. That is to say that in order to be considered saved, a person must first recognize his or her own corruption and inadequacy and repent of it. One must secondly place one's trust in Jesus rather than oneself. In order for these two concepts to remain intact, only two things have to be defended evangelically. The first thing that must be defended is the fact that humans are corrupt and incapable of perfection. On classic atheism, this is a problem because one must first prove some kind of transcendent moral standard that applies to everyone. Since the new atheists have done the Christian apologists the courtesy of arguing for moral standard, this becomes much easier. The second thing that must be defended is that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. This argument involves a defense of the New Testament documents and of historical facts related to the growth and advance of the Christian church. By defending these two things, the Christian apologist and evangelist prove that all humans have a need and that this need has been provided for. Part 1. Defining Apologetics. Chapter 1. What is the Christian apologist's audience? Ultimately, only God can remove people's blindness and rebellion and allow them to believe in Christ. That said, Christians are commanded not only to preach the gospel to all people, but to be prepared to give a defense for what they believe. In commanding the Christian to give a defense, the Apostle Peter is implying that the individual Christian should critically examine his or her beliefs to make certain that they are sound. This kind of self-inspection is repeatedly commanded throughout the Bible, where the Bereans searched the scripture to confirm what Paul was preaching to them, when John instructed his readers to test the spirits to see if they are from God, and when each of the apostles preached reasonable, evidential defenses for the gospel they spread. This is no less than the skeptical community calls upon Christians to do. Christians are frequently and openly mocked for just believing, and this is not entirely unjustified. If Christianity is in fact true, then it should hold up to in the light of critical inspection. Looking at and answering atheist objections to Christianity is healthy since it promotes self-inspection, which will ultimately refine a person's belief and give one reason to be confident in what he or she believes based on the fact that it holds up to criticism. Consequently, the primary audience for Christian apologetics should be other Christians. The bulk of Christians in the world have no deeply critically considered their reasons for believing, with the result that they tend to hold a number of ungrounded and often damaging beliefs, and they are not able to defend what beliefs they hold. These kind of Christians tend to be the first to cave to the pressure of academic criticism and relinquish their beliefs when it appears to them that they have no reasonable defense. With atheism becoming increasingly evangelical in nature, a vast number of Christians are forced to seek answers, and the seasoned apologist must be available to give them. The secondary audience for apologetics should be unbelievers who are looking for answers. The most vocal members of any particular community, be it atheist or theist, tend to be the least interested in rational discussion of others' views. But just because there are plenty of loudmouths more interested in talking than in listening does not mean that there aren't those who have an interest in discussing ideas and considering alternatives. For many of these people, Christianity seems unreasonable because no one has ever given them reasons, just a vague plea to have faith. For this reason, it is incumbent upon the Christian to be willing to listen as well as to talk. If Christians want to share their worldview and reasons with others, they should be willing to pay others the same courtesy. This practice gives the Christian the ability to understand what questions and objections the non-Christian may have, and to address these concerns. If Christianity is true, then Christians should have no reason to fear hearing alternative ideas. If Christianity is false, then a Christian would be hypocritical not to pursue the truth. Christians who spend all or most of their time arguing with entrenched atheists are doing neither themselves nor the atheist any good. If the person is clearly uninterested in even considering any answers to their objections, 
or countenancing any alternatives to their worldview, then the discussion becomes nothing more than a shouting match, each person trying to tout their position more loudly than the other. Three types of apologetics. External. External apologetics focus on evangelism. The primary purpose of apologetics to the external, to the church, is to remove intellectual objections to the faith. We live in a culture where it is the common belief that faith is the opposite of reason. It is not surprising, then, that most non-believers think that Christianity is unreasonable. They believe that science answers all the questions of the universe, and that religion is for those who need some kind of false hope or comfort. External apologetics exists for this kind of person. If it can be shown that not only is Christianity reasonable, but that it is not opposed to science and is the best model for reality, then this opens the door for people to accept the truth of Christian belief. Evangelism is not exclusive to emotional pleas of a person's testimony or the loving diligence of a believer in the life of an unbeliever although these things are certainly important and effective. There are plenty of examples of people coming to Christ because of the persuasiveness of a logical, coherent argument for the truthfulness of Scripture and the Gospel. C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity has been effective in many people's lives, as an example. External apologetics can, however, become a trap of arguing with those who are vehemently opposed to the truth of Christianity. And whose only concern is to discredit the faith. Arguments should never be directed at people, merely at ideas, which leads to the second kind of apologetics. Internal. Internal apologetics are equally important to external. These are apologetic arguments for the sake of the believer. These types of arguments address particular concerns that may be stumbling blocks to thoughtful believers, causing them to doubt their faith. In many Christian circles, the importance of apologetics within the church is underestimated. Many Christians live in a semi-isolated environment where all of their family, friends, and social activities are largely with other Christians. Consequently, they are unprepared for the aggressive skepticism and vitriolic hatred directed at Christians' beliefs, especially from academic circles. As a result of this, Many young people from Christian families who receive secular educations, especially at the college level, fall away from the faith because they do not know there are answers to these questions. And under the assault of a skeptical world, Christian belief seems flimsy at best. A Christian that does not take into account the hard questions about science and the accuracy of the Bible, in the words of Christ, has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arise on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Matthew 13, 21. Lateral. Lateral apologetics deals with false teachings within the church that could lead to error in doctrine, bad practices, and false religion. We will not focus on this kind of apologetics in this book. Good pastoral leadership and a diligent reading of Scripture are the most important tools in this kind of apologetic. A word about being wrong. It is important that Christians understand that it is possible to be mistaken about something they hold to be an important part of their belief, without their entire belief system collapsing. Whatever beliefs you hold, you must have good reasons, not just justifications, for why you hold them. A well-supported faith based in solid reasoning is much less easily shaken than one that is unsupported or unsupportable.